Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Containership Workshop. Um, we're going to start by um, David Aldwinkle introducing uh, the workshop itself. Well, good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are. This uh, workshop is on behalf of the ARENA Safety Committee and the ARENA IMO Committee. I welcome you all from around the world to this workshop on container ship safety. Recent container losses have raised major concerns within these two committees, which has stimulated the need for this workshop. Yes, my name is David Aldwinkle. I am Vice Chairman of the RENA Safety Committee. Our aim today is to give you, the RENA members, an opportunity to express your professional views and to ask questions on our subject. It is to understand better why more containers are being lost at sea and how we as naval architects and professional engineers can help, can help to stem these losses. I should like to now introduce you to Sarah Watts, the ex-chairman of the RENA Safety Committee, who is to manage and orchestrate the workshop. Sarah. Uh, thank you very much, David. Um, as David mentioned, my name's Sarah Watts. I was previously the chairman of the Safety Committee and I am a self-employed uh, consultant naval architect. Um, we're going to start this morning by um, letting the panel introduce themselves and then I'll talk a bit more about how we're actually going to structure the workshop today. So if I can first of all pass over to uh, Paul Coley to introduce himself. Good morning everyone um, and thank you for the opportunity to take part in this uh, workshop. Um, my name's Paul Coley and I'm uh, now retired from the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency where I worked for about 28 years. Um, I was involved with uh, developing rules and standards and also uh, introducing UK legislation to implement those standards. Um, I've also been involved with surveys of uh, the ships and also training of surveyors and for monitoring their performance. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And John, if you would like to introduce yourself. Yes, good. Uh... Good morning or afternoon, everyone. Um, my name's John Dickinson. I'm a master mariner. I served as master, unfortunately not on container ships, but I did work on container ships in the past. I also used to plan container ships for ACT and Blue Star Line. Alas, no longer with us. I was also the principal motor examiner in New Zealand and harbour master for 10 years in two ports in New Zealand, one being Wellington and the other Tauranga. And since then I've worked for the Nautical Institute and I've been a member of the RENA Safety Committee for probably about five or six years now. Thank you. Thank you, John. And finally, David Tozer, if you'd like to introduce yourself, please. Hello, yes, my name is David Tozer. Um, I started my career oh, a long time ago <laughs> with the Ministry of Defence and then uh, moved to Lloyd's Register. I was with them for 32 years before retiring uh, a few years ago. Um, I, my career with container ships started really with uh, hull structural analysis, um, ship motions analysis, moving on to design appraisal. Um, then as the ships were getting bigger and bigger there was there was more research and development to be done and i was uh, very much involved in that and it was a real privilege to be involved in in, in the development of container ships as, as they grew and grew and grew and grew address and the, having to address all the challenges that presented and along the way i've also spent a, a lot of time speaking to builders designers ship owners and to me very importantly uh, stevedores and the people who are actually handling the handling the cargo that these ships carry and uh, that led me down the route of, of trying to ensure that the ships that that we're involved in the design of are actually a safe place for these guys to be working both at sea and at, uh, ashore okay thank you very much david um and now uh if we move on to the main part of the workshop 
or the starter, the introduction, which is your um, keynote uh, talk. David, if you'd like to start that, please. Yes, um, as I said in my introduction, I've been involved with container shipping for many, many years. It's been a real privilege um, to be involved in, in the way these ships have grown from the, the, the ship you can see there to the, to the vast vessels we have today. So the growth of container shipping has been phenomenal since the 1960s, which is when the first ISO standard for size and strength of the containers was introduced. And the standardization of the way of transporting cargo has been, has been incredible. It means you can, you can load a container at, at the manufacturing point or where you're growing your vegetables or whatever, and then ship it to its final destination without any, any further handling of the contents of the box. It gives security, um, it solves many customs problems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's been absolutely phenomenal. Pretty well everything that can be carried in a container is containerized today, whether it be liquids, solids, and um, even grain is carried in containers sometimes. So a massive success story, uh, all starting from Malcolm McLean, who came up with the idea back in the, the 1930s. So, <clears throat> Alongside the, the, the massive growth in the trade of, of container shipping, there's been a relentless drive to provide the most economical transport of the containers by sea, as you can see from the map there. Um, we have massive trade from, from Asia, principally from China, running into Europe and Trans-Pacific into the US. Um, and this is getting more and more complex. Uh, if you have a look at the trading routes of the container ships, you'll find that there it's not a fixed pattern, but these are being tweaked and adjusted and modified all the time as, as the shipping lines are striving to get the most um, economic um, operation of their fleet. Um, with the economy has come the, come the drive for even bigger ships. Uh, a bigger ship, same number of crew, um, still one engine or, or whatever, the, the bigger is best on, on the trades which are long enough to justify it and which are serving, uh, which are serving ports, which can accommodate the larger vessels. So we've seen this, this relentless drive towards bigger and bigger vessels. And in fact, it's been so strong that existing vessels have had to cascade down. They've had to find other places of work as the, as the new tonnage comes online. And it's led to gross oversupply of container shipping a number of times. It goes round and round again. With a, a, new, a new concept comes in, they're much more cost effective. And that means that the other ships are then pushed aside, pushed onto the North South trades or wherever. And there's a cascade process where the ships run from long haul deep sea to the shorter haul, then down to the third tier and into feedering. Again, assuming that the ports and that all the facilities at the ports can handle the ships of that size. So it's, it's a massive challenge for shipping lines to, to deal with the, this process. So on the um, Asia Europe and Trans-Pacific trade, that's where, that's where we've seen the largest um, ships uh, coming into service. Um, give an example of the size of the ships. The Marco Polo um, came into, into service in 2012, that's just nine years ago, and she was the largest container ship in the world with a capacity of 16,000 TEU. It was phenomenal compared with what had been seen in, in previous years. The growth has been enormous. Um, then just a year later, in February 2013, the first of the Maersk Triple E class was delivered, and that was more than 18,000 TEU. Interesting observation, um, Marco Polo is a length of 396, the Triple E was 400 metres. I don't know of any container ship um, in existence today, or in the past, uh, with a length more than 400 metres. It'd be interesting to know why that limit um, has, has been set and how that works. Because logic would say that a longer ship may actually be, be a more profitable, a more effective vessel as the capacity goes up. So now we've reached another milestone. We've got to 24,000 TEU. Is this growth in ship size going to continue? So apart from assessing the economic viability of even larger vessels, there are many technical and operational issues which need to be considered. So there've been many challenges along the way. And uh, right at the outset, actually it was the, it was 
um, Marshall Meeks papers uh, in, were in, we find in the transactions of this institution presented in 1970, examine the operational and, and design and construction issues of, sh of uh, container ships. Um, they're impressive papers, actually. I've been reading them through. They're worth, they're worth a look. Um, so Marshall Meek uh, and people who were developing the ships at that time uh, addressed many, many of the issues, but as the ships have carried on growing, there are even more areas which want further examination. For example, we've all heard of the phenomenon of uh, parametric rolling. Uh, very large roll angles, maybe 40 degrees roll angle experienced by, by large, the larger vessels, but it's certain vessels operating in certain sea areas which seem to be vulnerable to that phenomenon, and it's still occurring. So that's something that we, should, we need to get a handle on. Um, I certainly, I, I sail a dinghy, and I know when that rolls to 30 degrees, I've had enough. So to be on a big ship at 40 degrees, no, thank you. Securing the container stacks so that they don't fail during a voyage, um, yet we're still able to load them and unload them and lash them and secure them safely and easily, remains a major challenge. Now we're seeing stacks up to 10, 11, 12 tiers high on deck. Um, it, it's, it's a massive challenge. From the pictures there, you, you, know, you can see, you, you, you see there's a 45 foot container. So these, these are not just rectangular boxes stacked up. They're different sizes, different lengths, different heights, and it becomes really complex. We see a lashing bridge there. It was an attempt to, to lift the securing point higher up above the deck to get a, a, better, a better grip on the containers for want of a better expression. But they, they themselves bring, bring further challenges. We see their um, power lashing for the lashing rods, two rods running in parallel to give extra strength. Um, that's complex because the containers can slide and move slightly. As they move and slide slightly, so the rods get tighter and looser as the ships at sea. Remember that the ships themselves are flexible, they're twisting and bending all the time. And the practical issue of getting the lashing right, if lashings are put into the top casting of a container, they won't, won't work effectively. They must be in the bottom casting of the next tier, unless it's a power lash. So getting the lashings put on correctly is so, so important. And then what happens high up in the stacks where well, you just can't get to them? Stevedores can't get up there to lash them. But, um, then you're relying on, on special fittings to hold everything together and they, they have to work effectively when these ships are bouncing and moving around at sea, whipping, springing. You can have vertical accelerations at the bow greater than one G. So the, these containers are actually lifting off and banging back down again, right up at the bow. So rectangular boxes, it sounds easy, but this, this is a re really tricky getting the lashing and, and, and the calculations right to ensure these containers stay in place. And they do fail. What's, what, but why? Is, is it because the design of the containers themselves is wrong or the maintenance of the containers is not adequate? Incorrect lashings, I was saying, if the lashings are not put on correctly, or indeed the, the lashing arrangement has not been designed properly. Overloading of the boxes, the temptation to put an extra, an extra tunnel or two inside the box, not to mention the weight distribution um, for, to, between the forward and aft ends of the boxes. Um, is, that, is that an issue? I believe so. Um, incorrect weight distribution in the stacks. When the stacks are only two or three tiers high, it doesn't matter too much. Uh, what the weight is in individual containers. Um, but if, if you're stacking 10 or 11 high, you, you can't put much weight in the top boxes, otherwise that, that will uh, destroy the stack. So getting that weight distribution right is, is really important. Um, inadequate motions prediction. We've all talked about uh, parametric roll, um, but what about, you know, can, can we actually calculate the six degrees of freedom of motion that these ships experience at sea, and add to that the wind loading, it becomes complex. Have we got a good enough model that can be applied to the calculations of the ship motion and thus to calculate the, the forces in the stacks to make sure that everything's satisfactory? Um, and in that we have the, the, the lashing calculation methodology itself. With three, four, five tiers high, uh, 
linear methods work, work very effectively. But now we're running to the much higher tiers. The mathematics is horrendous. It's, it's non-linear non responses. Uh, it's it, separation of the boxes. Uh, it, the, the, the slack in the, in the twist locks and so on is critical. The, the, the whole thing is very complex. And I'm, I'm not aware yet that we have a, a workable solution uh, to deal with these very, very high stacks uh, as effectively as is necessary to, to reduce the number of, number of uh, losses. Just looking at the boxes themselves briefly, um, when Malcolm McLean invented the concept, it, it, the idea was the standard box, but it's not quite so clear cut now. Um, today we benefit from standardization of the of the containers, but in fact, there's a whole range of container lengths, um, heights, and it's only the width that still remains constant. Um, the ISO standard, when it came in, set the requirements for dimensions and for the strength of the, of the containers, and that provided the baseline that we now work to, and there have been generations of um, the ISO standards, which have enhanced certain features of the boxes. Um, the, the standards also cover features like reefers, tank containers, marking of the containers and so on. That's, that's all covered by various standards. And the containers themselves are built under class survey to ensure that they comply um, with, the, with the standards. Um, but there we go, that's, that's the cargo that we're carrying. And I just throw in the point here, are those containers designed and built in accordance with the current ISO standards, are they fit for purpose? for the very high stacks that we're seeing on the big ships. Is it time to be revising the ISO standard to take account of what we're now subjecting these boxes to? Now, cargo planning. It's imperative that the containers are stowed not only in a structurally acceptable way, i.e. the containers are gonna be okay, the lashing's gonna be okay, but also that um, the vessel strength and the strength is, is okay as well. Um, but also that the, the hazards of dangerous goods are taken into account. You haven't got incompatible cargoes near to each other. Um, what about the condition of the ship, the, of the ship itself? You, you've got to have the right trim, the right heel, right GM. You've got to provide ventilation for uh, refrigerated containers in the hold and make sure it's all acceptable on deck providing access to, to maintain reefer boxes. Um, you've got to make sure the whole thing is commercially optimum so that you haven't got to start digging for containers in port to get to the one that you want to discharge. Um, so it's a really, really complex uh, business getting the cargo planning right. Um, the software is phenomenal. I mean, I'm really impressed by the guys who do this. <laughs> um, and then having done all of that, what about the container that arrives in the port uh, at the last minute? Oh, no, no, we're just popping it across to Rotterdam. Can we put it on the top of the stack? It's only a short voyage. Who's responsible for making that decision? That's when the commercial pressure comes to bear. So it must be accepted that the oceans of the world will sometimes win um, and it jeopardizes the safety of the crew, the vessel and the environment. Where do we stand in all of this as naval architects? Well, there's not a lot we can do about poor operation, like we can see in those, um, in those photos there. But it's our responsibility to ensure that the technical challenges are dealt with to the best of our ability by promoting research, suitable tools, analysis tools, and education of those involved in the, in the operation of these ships to ensure that those who own, plan, and sail these vessels are aware of matters which must be considered when they send them to sea. It's a complex task. We've got to make sure that everybody involved understands the challenges they're faced with. And we have a major part to play in that. And that's just some of the subject areas which affect it. And we, as naval architects, have an involvement, a greater or lesser involvement in every single one of those. Okay, thank you very much, David, for that very thought-provoking um, presentation. Hopefully it's given people um, something to think about. This workshop is very much um, about gaining views from the membership. So this was, David's presentation was very much about stimulating 
um, discussion and debate. Um, I've taken all the contributions that have been sent into this workshop and where appropriate, I've amalgamated them into some, some sort of key topic areas, which we'll go through during the course of the workshop. Um, the plan is that I will um, pose the question comment to the panel and they will comment as appropriate. And during this time, there will be the opportunity using the chat box um, to add comments and I'll uh, hopefully be able to invite speakers during the uh, dialogue to actually uh, pose uh, comments directly. But this is very much an opportunity for the RENA Safety Committee to engage with the wider membership of RENA on the subject of container ships um, and how we can actually improve the safety of the container ship industry. So thank you. I noticed there have been a number of comments already put in the chat box. I will, as I work through this workshop, try and pick up on some of those points raised already. So I think the first um, comment that I will um, read out uh, has come from a, a retired member. And I think it's particularly pertinent because he was a retired member who was involved in developing the original rules for freight container securing arrangements. And at that time, the stacks were three high with a capacity of 1,020 foot containers. And the, the question really here is from the early days of development of the rules, the vessels have grown exponentially. And his question is, how have the rules been developed to deal with the vastly greater forces in the huge stacks? And perhaps I'd ask David to comment on that first. Yeah. Nothing like starting with an easy question. <laughs> um, yeah, as I said in, in, in my introduction, uh, the, the change is phenomenal from the, uh, the Panamax ships that we saw up until about 90, the mid 80s to the rapid growth right the way through to the 24,000. Um, and we're still carrying the same cargo, still carrying the same boxes and still trying to apply the same methods. Or I'd suggest even more significant I think the ship operators are trying to apply the same thinking now to what they were applying um, those years ago. Uh, we're still looking at, some, some are still looking at uh, a cargo securing manual, which tells them what lashing to use and, and, and so on. And they, they, they use the standard cases from the manual and, and, and apply that. that. That's still perfectly valid for the, for the smaller ships. And I'm afraid it doesn't quite work for, for the bigger ships. Um, fortunately, uh, the, the larger ships are not being required to carry such heavy containers uh, throughout their stow. Um, give an example, the, the Panamax ships are generally specified as um, the number of 14 tonne containers that they can carry. That's the basis for working out the, the, the effective capacity of the ships. Um, for a 14, 18, 20,000 TU ship, the number 14 thousand containers, four, sorry, 14 tonne containers that can be carried is, is not particularly relevant. The, the, the average weight of that those can, big ships are carrying maybe three or four tonnes. I mean, the, the, the upper tiers are designed for carrying empty containers. That's the fact. Um, so the whole game is changing. And as I said, the, the way the stacks deform and, and, and uh, as, as the ship rolls is, is much more complex with the higher stacks. Most people don't realize that the on-deck stacks of containers are all standing there in total isolation from their neighbors. There's no link between the stacks whatsoever. And that, that's an operational thing. Uh, it would slow down um, uh, what, what's happening in port. So every, every stack is taken separately. Um, and to, to imagine 12 containers stacked one above the other as, a, as, a, as, as an isolated stack, and to expect it to stay there when the ship is rolling um, 30 degrees maybe. You, the, on the bridge of a ship in a severe roll, you could be moving transversely at 30 miles an hour. That's what these containers are experiencing. It's a wonder that anything gets there in one piece when you think of it that way. I mean, when, if you're moving house and putting all your precious 
possessions into a container, think very carefully how, how it's packed, because you could be lucky, it's, it could have a smooth ride, but equally, everything could be really shaken around. So it's, it's, a, it's a severe environment that the containers are experiencing, exacerbated by being high up in, 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 on the bigger ships. Um, so yeah, big challenges. So how, how, how has the industry responded to that? I said the, the, the operators are, are trying to keep it as simple as they can, um, but we have a responsibility to develop a workable solution which will enable them to, to, to deliver their cargo and not deliver a letter of compensation. That's what it's about. Um, I know from, from the, the research work that I've done on it that to try and put more complex analysis methods into the loading computer is almost unworkable because the ship will have sailed by the time the computer's finished checking the entire stone. That's a big challenge. And we've yet to find that, that intermediate solution where you may lose a, a ton or two of, of, of cargo capacity, but you've actually got something which, which can be uh, worked in the real world. The, we haven't got the final answer yet. There's, there's work to be done. Okay, thank you very much, David. Perhaps I could ask uh, John next to make some comments on that. Yes. Um, I, I spent several years as a ship planner, um, but in those days we used to get very excited over three and a half thousand TNU. I think, uh, I seem to recall, and it's, it's some years since I did it now, that uh, for the block stow on deck, the top stows, we used to get have what was termed bridging pieces, which would attach two side-by-side -side containers together from the corner fittings. I don't know, and that would make the stow much more secure. I, I, from what David's saying, it sounds like they don't use them anymore for the, the speed of uh, moving, I suppose, a, a container exchange on one of these big ships, you could have five, six, seven thousand TEU to move which would take some time if you had to undo bridging pieces and replace them, etc. I worry that these ships, because they have a much reduced crew as well. So when they're at sea, there was, a, there was an incident, and I can't remember which ship it was quite recently, that they lost some containers and because the ship was so big, the crew didn't know that till the morning when they sort of strolled up the fore part of the ship and noticed there were a couple of hundred containers missing. I struggle to see how we can avoid things like that with the scheduling of the ships, the size of the ships, and the, um, as I said, the, the, the minimum crew they carry. The, the crew can't do anything when, if something happens really. There's only 20, 22 people on the ship can take 16 to 20,000 containers. It's a, it, to me, it's a, a bit of a worry and any ideas that come out of this uh, workshop would, I think would be very useful. Um, Stack weights, uh, we talked about earlier. The, one of the main problems with containers is the loading of the container itself. Even if you've got a, quite a light container, eight containers up, if the cargo in there starts moving with the ship moving, it compounds it. And that's when you start losing containers. And it's very difficult to know how a container is packed that you're at the mercy of the freight forwarders the people who stuff the container and again that's uh, something we can't do much about the misdeclared cargo is another thing uh, it's cost a bit more to ship a dangerous goods in a container and dangerous goods these days there's many more i mean paints are dangerous good 
things like that. And so a lot of, certainly I've heard from the Far East, they are misdeclared, especially fireworks, that's another thing. So uh, there are many problems associated with these very big container ships, which uh, they're going to take some time to clear up. Yeah, okay, nothing. thank you very much, John, for your comment. If I can just pass over now to Paul, who I think has some uh, comments on this subject. Yes, thank you, Sarah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, my, my point is uh, really looking at David's last slide and the many factors that need to be taken into consideration. Just highlight how complex this, this issue is. Um, and many of those uh, items, those issues, are related to the operational aspects of running a container ship. Um, there's been a lot of information produced, and I'd just like to refer to um, the IMO, which has produced an MSC circular 1228, for example, which gives guidance to masters to avoid dangerous situations in adverse weather. Um, and, you know, this uh, parametric rolling and uh, synchronous rolling, um, all these factors are very important and the master needs to understand those and how to avoid them. And of course, there's, there's a limit to what naval architects themselves can actually do about that. Um, and the Maritime Coast Guard Agency issued a Marine Information Note 357 on that subject. But uh, what I would like to just throw out there for all the naval architects who are listening, is um, what, what can designers do about this? Um, clearly, there's probably not a lot you can do about um, the rolling of the ship other than operational matters. But uh, we can perhaps do something about the design of the lashing, the stowage of containers. And when this topic was raised at one of the P&I Club forums, the uh, subject was uh, put forward, I, I proposed that perhaps it's time to have the container guides running full height of the stack so that uh, there was less involvement from an operation aspect to put tie bars on, um, lashings and so on to secure the cargo. Um, but the response to that was oh no, we can't do that because it will slow down the operations for loading and unloading of cargoes. Well, I think that we've got a challenge there because clearly we can't just, it seems to me, we can't just have unrestricted um, operations to allow such a huge ship to turn around in just a few hours, but then subsequently lose half the containers um, that we've just put on there because they're not properly secured. So I think there has to be a compromise in terms of how quickly we can load them, but also to make sure that those containers will be secure. And as, as John says, you know, they used to tie the containers together with bridges. Um, perhaps, you know, these sort of devices need to be rethought and uh, we need to be able to secure must be a relatively straightforward point that could be done uh, if there's a willingness in the industry to take it on board thank you okay thank you paul um i see there's a load of comments in the um chat area and i will be picking up on some of those as we start going through the various sections that i've got here so um the, the first big topic that I've got here is um, about container design, certification and inspection. So um, I'll just read through a few points that I've got here, which is, is the current container design standard appropriate for the latest ultra large vessels? And should there be a new ISO version to take account of the very high stacks that are being used today? Um, should containers be watertight to allow them to float and hence easier recovery? And who is actually responsible for the structural integrity of the container before loading? So perhaps um, I can throw that again to uh, David as a starting point for comment. 
Yeah, I mentioned earlier, um, the container design standard, the ISO standard, um, may, it may want an upgrade uh, because we're using containers in a slightly different way now. Uh, I was always led to believe that this would be really difficult because there are so many containers out there. But when you consider that there are millions of containers being manufactured every year, um, it's, it's not so difficult. I also believe that some of the main shipping lines who are fortunate enough, fortunate enough to carry their own boxes do actually have those boxes manufactured to their own design standard. They, they build in additional strength. So it, it, they're not limited by um, the, the challenges that come from the higher stacks, that they're actually designing the containers for that particular type of, type of loading. Um, so yeah, I think this this is this is worth a look. Um, see whether whether the ISO standards need to be enhanced. Um, the other factors as well, uh, the the lashing rods I think are pretty well okay, but it'd be rather nice if there was a self tensioning lashing rod out there. I've never seen one. I've, I've seen a few ideas, but none none would actually uh, cope with being thrown around and <laughs> deal with the uh, the traumas of being on a ship. Um, the twist locks, we, we've seen a whole load of variations of twist locks from manual to um, semi-automatic to fully automatic, and each has its own benefits and drawbacks. Uh, the challenge is, because the stevedores are not allowed to climb up on the boxes anymore, thank goodness, um, anything that's out of reach, as it were, has to be um, it, um, automatic. Uh, Semi-automatics uh, work by uh, using a long pole, so, so they latch. Uh, a spring-loaded latch when you load them onto the ship, but when you get to the point of discharge, uh, the stevedores can reach up with a long pole, pull the knob, and it, and it releases the, the uh, semi-automatic twist locks. That's great, but you can't even do that. Higher up, you then have to start looking at fully automatics. Very, very clever idea, um, but it's found when, when the ship, it, it relies on the rolling of the ship to lock, to lock the twist locks. Um, but you can actually get circumstances where the combined motions, the, the rolling and the heaving together can cause a situation where the fully automatic twist locks don't lock. In addition to that, you've got uh, the, the tolerances on the, the spacing of the corner castings on the containers and the tolerances on the, the, uh, the fittings can actually work together in a way which will cause them not, not to be totally reliable. So I think there's a bit of work needed there as well to, to, to get the standards sorted out uh, for the tolerances on, on, on those components. So, yeah. Um, I've, um, I've just read um, a note from uh, Alejandro Medrano. It says, Has it ever have we ever considered electromagnetic locks to prevent the container movements? I don't know whether you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Um, that, that was, <laughs> When I was at Lloyd's Register, we used to see all sorts of ideas coming across the desk um, for ways of e even making the, the twist locks an integral part of the boxes themselves um, and linking them together through the stacks. So a single control would release the whole lot or um, you say electromagnetic ones, um, but none have actually come, th come, come through in, in, into use as far as I know. Um, I think partly because of cost, but also as I say, it, it, to get something which is going to cope with the salt water and, and the rigours of, of life in the real world uh, is, is really challenging. Yeah, so I see Dennis Barber's commented, fully auto automatic locks cannot distinguish between upthrust due to container crane and rolling tilt. Um, and interestingly, uh, he's also commented here, in law, the master is responsible for the ship's safe sailing condition with 18,000 TEU. How is this possible when well known that misdeclaration is common? I think that's a, a very fair point. Um, Paul, do you have any comments on this subject? Well, I think those are very good points that have been made. Um, and I think it, it will probably be wrong to take the responsibility away from the master because uh, obviously they have ultimate responsibility to sail or not sail, but they can't do this work on their own. Um, nowadays, it seems that these large container ships, first of all, have to have sophisticated computer systems to back up the loading and discharge, just from a logistics point of view. They also have to be able to calculate 
the force is involved because every time you change the the loading of containers uh, you're changing all the forces um, the stability of the vessel is obviously uh, needing to be checked as well because obviously if you have the ship too stable your forces are even greater so you've got to be within certain limits so computerization is a very important point here um, so i think from a master's perspective what's necessary is that they have to do all they possibly can to make sure that all the boxes have been ticked before they they decide that the ship can sail um, misdeclaration of of the boxes themselves has been a big issue and the imo has taken some action there to ensure that the um, verified weight of the containers is is enhanced but again there are you know potential gaps in there but I think everyone's trying to ensure that the, the best possible information is provided to the ship, but it's certainly not 100% guaranteed. And um, I think there are ways and means, perhaps having weight checks on the gantries as the, um, as the containers are loaded on board the ships, um, they can do a quick a uh, load check on the containers to make sure that they're not putting the fully loaded boxes on the top of the stacks, for example, and to alert the uh, the master if something untoward is is uh, identified. Thank you, Sarah. If I can chip in here, Sarah, but, um, I, I, one, one of the challenges is the, the process by which the, the, the storage is planned, and it's done two or three days before the ship arrives in port. Um, it's done ashore, that process arrives, and then the ship arrives and the containers are loaded on board. The weights of the containers are as per the declaration. Um, they can be weighed on, on the, um, the weigh bridge on the way into the terminal. They are also weighed when they're picked up off the quayside to go onto the ship. Um, it's there to protect, to protect the, uh, the, the crane as much as anything. But, what do you do if you pick a container up and it's, it's two tons overweight? Do you carry on and put it on the ship or do you reject it? And think of the logistics problem in the port of what to do with all these containers, which are, which are a ton or two too heavy. How do you deal with it? I mean, that, that, that is a massive challenge for them. Um, and you can't even uh, recalculate the stow based on the actual weights you're measuring as you put them on board. Because as I said before, the, the computer time at the moment is, is enormous and it's just not practical. And that, that to me is, is the real practical issue that the industry is facing. It's that lead time, getting everything worked out and then an exception comes along, which, which is a misdeclaration or whatever. OK, thank you, David. John, do you have any comments on this? Uh, yes. Um... It's going to be a very brave captain of a ultra large container ship that's going to stop the ship. When you when you pre plan a ship, you get the weights etc. from the uh, from the trade manager and whatnot. Then you you plan your you plan your discharge and your load and it's sequenced down on in the port. And to if you alter the sequence, it can cause quite a few problems further down the line. So you can say it's a brave captain who's gonna say, well, I'm not gonna take that one because it's two tons overweight. And the other question you've got to consider is the, uh, and something I, I'm not too sure about is when the, when the crane lifts the container, it obviously it shows you the weight of the container. How, yeah, how you, is the crane driver going to say, well, I'm not going to put that on board. It's two tons overweight if he's got what the weight should be. I don't know. There's, there's so many human problems involved at that level. Um, but it's, very difficult and the certainly when I was planning I, I used to know the captains of the ships and when we were loading or did 
I was a central planner, so I planned from the office. I didn't, wasn't down in the terminal. And I used to go down to the ship and I talk to the captain. Now, I don't know whether that happens these days. I'm not too sure because 20,000 containers is bloody frightening. <laughs> to me, it is. And uh, how they get around these human frailties is a, is a problem. Well, interestingly, on that subject, John, uh, one question I got is the number of stakeholders in terms of planning uh, these days. You have central planners, ship planners, terminal planners, etc. in the stowage process. Is this excessive having this level of um, planners and is it causing the wrong behaviours? Is it because it's split up? Is it because there is no... Uh, relationship between what happens in the port and the central planners that is causing problems? Well, it uh, depends where your central plan is based, I suppose. Um, when I was planning, it was in Wellington. The ships came to Wellington and to Auckland, to Littleton, Dunedin, Sydney, and Auckland. But as a central planner, you'd send the Bay plan off down to the terminal, who would plan, who would then put it into their system. If there were any problems, they would contact the central planner. And then when it was in the system, it would be sequenced by the terminal planner and the Steve and Auto all, all got their little bits of paper and whatnot, as it was then. And uh, the ship was loaded. The planners knew the it said he would always the planners would always go on the ship and discuss it with the mate and the master but whether they do that these days i don't know but uh it's um the size of ships uh, i think don't help the challenge it's, it's a challenge yes right and the other thing is of course when i was doing it every ship planner had been at sea you know they knew what ships were like um they were all master mariners so they all got a good idea of ship stability uh, i don't know what they do these days they might have university degrees instead thank you very much for your thoughts on that john uh moving on these are uh, some con uh, questions on um the csm the container securing manuals um is the scope to improve the current content stroke format of the container securing manuals and their verification by class, noting the latter is typically for form and content only, and therefore the stowage and securing arrangements in the CSM may not be fully checked? Uh, a further question is, does the development of route specific class notation by class societies, which provides allowances on the original CSM loading limits, mean that margins of safety are effectively being diminished based on statistical calculations of probable weather exposure during a voyage rather than actual encountered weather conditions. And a final point, the design of the current lashing equipment is a scope to enhance this given the increasing stack heights, um, bearing in mind the reference to uh, fully automatic twist locks, which were cited as a factor in the Svend Borg Mersk incident, they have a lower factor of safety when in automatic mode. Uh, perhaps, David, I can go to you first on those points. Yeah, but uh, dealing with the lashing, lashing fittings first, I think you'll find that the, uh, the strength of the fully automatics is the same as the strength of the semi-automatics. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I think the, the, the principal difference is that if if you see a stack of a stack of containers where the whole stack has gone over you can be pretty sure that it's secured using semi-automatics if you find all the containers have come apart so they're standing on their ends or they've gone into into the uh, the water then that could well be they've, they've been using fully automatics okay it's an, obs an observation um csm uh to approve a CSM on form and content is, 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 is one step, but um, quite often the, the, the technical content of the CSM is also uh, approved by class. I believe that's often a, 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 an option. Um, yeah, and a very good option too. 
uh, um, otherwise who's who's actually verifying that the all of the stowage arrangements and the standards and everything are acceptable for for the for the ship as built um whether the, uh, i think the question was about uh, weather dependent lashing um that's it is now possible to to calculate what the likely uh, motions of the ship are going to be during the particular voyage based on the um, sea area that it's going to be sailing through and the season. And you can actually find the different sizes of ships uh, ship, you know, sailing with different GMs. You, you can actually uh, come up with it. You can decide whether the ship is particularly vulnerable or not in that particular place at that particular time. And you can use that as a basis for judgment on, on the, the forces that you allow within the container stack and thus the amount of cargo you can carry. Um, but what comes with that is a responsibility on the ship, a responsibility on the master, who's actually, I don't mean this in a condense anyway, uh, the, you have to look out the window and see what the, the, what the sea is actually doing. And if the sea is more extreme than the prediction led you to believe, then you have to take action. And that may be changing heading, it may be adjusting speed. Um, in the case of parametric roll, it may require an increase in speed, strangely enough, and that's one of the non-intuitive features of parametric rolling. So yeah, if, 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 if the ship is prepared to take responsibility for looking out, assessing what the sea state is, and making a decision, an informed decision based on that, which could inter interfere with the schedule, that's the commercial risk. Then, as a result of, if they do that, then they can they can potentially carry more cargo, and that's where okay. the, the the weather dependent lashing concept come from. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, Paul, do you have any further comments on this? Not really. I think David's uh, closer to it. Has been closer to it with uh, the approvals in class. Um, ultimately, it has to be from the designers and the uh, shipyards who submit the original details about the loading um, and the stresses involved. Um, they have to take the responsibility for doing those. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. John, any further comments? Yes, um, I would like to think that you lash your cargo for the worst expected weather that may happen on your passage. That's what I would like to do if I was captain of those ships. I would, I don't like the idea of saying, oh, well, it's not going to be so bad this time. We won't use the heavier lashings, you know. Now you lash them so they, you can, you lash them as if you're going to expect a hurricane, I think would be the best way to put it. That's my thoughts, anyhow. Definitely agree with that. Yes, yeah, thanks, John. I suspect commercial pressures um, might challenge people to do that, which is unfortunate. Right. Yeah, commer commercial pressure is actually one of the worst things that can happen these days. It's a container, a container company, um, the shipping company, sells its space on its schedule, and to compromise a schedule is sacrosanct. You don't do that. Um, I say when I was scheduling container ships, we used to phone around the container companies and say, when's your ship arriving? And they would lie to us and we'd lie back saying when our ship was arriving. And the, the worst you can do is, is delay, a, delay a container ship. You, missed, you might miss the berth, you know, they, it's horrendous and I should imagine on these big ones it's going to be worse because the bigger the ship the more expense on delays. Anyhow, that's my thought. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm just trying to find, so uh, Mohammed Khalid um, put in a note on training here uh, who's looking at the root causes of accidents and he said the human factor uh, has been the root cause for a large number of accidents. I believe training crews is more important than to improve the design or improve mechanical control. We have so much regulation for ship design. Is crew training keeping up simultaneously? And alongside that subject, we've actually got some more comments on training, which is, 
whether the training given to the crew and port staff is adequate or is it being overridden by commercial pressures from the operators? And following on from that, what sort of safety reminders actually work best on board the vessel? So given that we might train people, how do we make sure that those messages uh, in safety are uh, adhered to, uh, bearing in mind the pressure of the small number of crew that you've got on board, et cetera? Um, perhaps I'll pass that over to uh, John in the first place. Yeah, um, that's, those are some very good points there. The, under the ISM code, your crew has to be trained appropriately for the jobs they're going to do. Um, I would think on these massive container ships that the certainly the chief officer and the master would have to be have a special um, a lot more training as far as stability and is concerned. Also, when it comes to things like parametric rolling, how to I mean, I I've had to, I've been on a ship where we were had synchronous rolling, but how do you recognize parametric rolling? What do you do when it happens? Uh, these sort of things, and they would have to, they probably are looking at them. And I, I've, I've not been on a full mission simulator for a couple of years now, but uh, you can simulate a lot on these new simulators. So I think they, you know, masters on these ships must and the senior officers must go through this training. Whether they do or not, I don't know. Um, it's, uh, yeah, they do need specialized training. And it's, uh, unfortunately, a lot of uh, ship owners used, certainly used to, look on training as a cost rather than an investment. That's my yeah. thoughts at the moment. Okay, thank you very much, John. Perhaps I can go to you, Paul, next. Yeah, I think as John has just said, um, ISM code has uh, made it a requirement that people should be appropriately trained over and above the, the mandatory requirements for, for training um, according to the specific ship type and, and operation. And um, I think training is one thing, and um, certainly having an awareness of the issues is a good starting point. Having experienced it for yourself is, is a good second point um, to understand, oh, that's what it actually means. And uh, these heavy, uh, these severe rolling uh, angles are caused by this particular sea state. Um, but ultimately, I think the difficulty the crews face is how to say no. Um, it's very difficult to change the schedule to say, well, I need to weather route differently. I need to slow down. And it's those difficult decisions that the master has to make. And sometimes it can be their job on the line. And this is the, the most difficult challenge we all face as the entire industry is how can we make sure that the right decisions can be made for the right reasons, as well as giving them all the training. OK, thank you very much, Paul. Um, David, do you have some comments? Yeah, training is so important, but I, th I think it's training in, in, in a very broad sense. Um, just to mention first the parametric role, uh, I think training is, in, is, is important for that, to, to understand what it is, what's causing it. Uh, the reality is that parametric role occurs, you know, three or four roles on the ships being to 40 degrees and back. Um, so there's not very much you can do when it actually occurs, but the, the training says these are the conditions which, which can possibly cause it. And there are, there are tools available now, bridge tools, to, to help predict this. Um, so yeah, training to, to, to use those tools or to use a guide, ma the, the manual or whatever, to, to make sure the ship isn't in a situation where it's going to be vulnerable to parametric rolling occurring. Um, the Training for the crew and, and, and the officers, how many of them have just come from a VLCC onto a container ship? They've got a strange cargo, strange ship, that container ships have their own um, characteristics. 
So where's, where's the easy guy that says, right, introduction to the ship and how it works and all the key issues. Um, what about the training, in the information for the lashes, the stevedores when they come on board? What's unusual about this ship? What do they need to know so they can go and do their job, not only in a way which ensures the cargo is going to be secure, but also in a way that they can, they can operate safely. I get reports regularly of, of injuries and, and so on to stevedores, and normally a stevedore who's injured doesn't ever go back to work again. So making sure those guys training in the sense of top of the gangway, there's a, there's a notice that tells you what you need to know about this ship. And when you go to the lashing bridge or wherever your working place is, where's the notice that tells you what's, what's special about that ship you need to know about. So making sure that the people who are on that ship actually understand what it is and how it ticks and, and how they can work safely on it. Um, yeah, so big issue. It doesn't necessarily have to be an expensive, an expensive thing. If it, if it is just a poster that's put up in the right place, just to keep people aware of, of the important issues. I was involved in the production of the, the standard clubs, uh, Master's Guide to, to uh, Container Securing. And that was designed to go on a coffee table. You know, while you're drinking your coffee, have a flick through. And that, that, that's training and it's easily accessible, doesn't cost it very much at all but it's actually going to improve the safety and the efficiency of the operation of the ship. Okay, thank you very much, uh, David. I'm just scanning through the messages here. Um, the, uh, I noticed that, thank you very much for all your contributions. I am, while I'm chairing it, trying to scan through the messages and introduce them as I can. Um, just as, um, a break from the sort of structure that I've got here. Uh, Ian Winkle, perhaps you might like to speak through your message from 10 o'clock this morning on the uh, video that was um, uh, supplied when we went out with the email originally. Um, are, you, uh, are you unmuted and can you speak? Again, there we are, is that okay? Can you yes, hear me? that's lovely. Yes, if you would like yes. to. Uh, speak well, I was just I was I was interested to look in detail at the video, particularly at the difference between the forward stacks and the after stacks. Uh, at the forward end of the ship, there was no perceivable loss at all in the forward stacks, um, which implies that the pitching action of the vessel hadn't had much to do with the, or at least hadn't affected things at that point. Go to the aft end, and you'll notice the stacks are flipped in two different directions. Uh, one, one, one went to port, one went to starboard, and they've all split, uh, tend to split at the um, be junction between containers two and three, which is the point at which they were lashed. So you've got the lower containers tending to go one way and the upper containers tending to go the other, um, which suggests some really extreme um, motion characteristics on the, on the vessel at the aft end, which is probably a con combination of pitch and roll in a, in a peculiar combination. So you're getting very extreme loads on the aft end uh, at, at that time. I also noticed that some of the containers appear to have collapsed uh, at the bottom of the stacks. And you've got nine high stacking at the aft end. So uh, that appeared to be a, a, a problem in this particular case. You've got containers collapsing. That also appears to have happened all the way through the middle stacking uh, of, of the vessel between the bridge and the, uh, and the engine room. Um, I also noticed that the stacks immediately forward of the bridge and in front of the engine room also hadn't moved. They were all 40 foot containers. They weren't mixed containers. The stacks forward of that appeared to have 40s and 45s. And I think this has something, that this may have something to do with the problem. You can't adequately lash the combinations uh, very well as far as I'm concerned. I, I would like to look at um, proper um, cross connection of the stacks in some way. You can't do that if you've got different uh, lengths of container and different heights of container. And that's what was happening, I believe, in the middle. So those are observations I've, I've made looking at the video. And I wonder what comments there might be from the, from the panel. Okay, perhaps, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, perhaps over to you first, David. 
Sure. Um, no losses forward, that uh, could well be because the stacks are shorter. It depends on the type of motion that's causing the failure. Um, the aft end, the, flip, the flipped in two directions, that's uh, two points on that. One is um, whipping can have a very big effect at the aft end. It, essentially, the, the vibration of the ship, um, it flips its tail up and that can actually cause the jumping of the containers at the aft end. And that can be quite a very a large percentage of the load on experienced by the containers is caused by the whipping. So that's a possible cause there. Um, nine high flipped in two directions. Um, so the, st the stack is actually split. Um, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, it, particularly with the higher lashing bridges, when you do the very detailed calculation of the, of the forces as they run through the lashing rods, through the fittings and through the boxes, you do find that that's what happens. You can, you can actually show that by calculation. So I'm, I'm, I'm really encouraged by what, by, by what you said. That means that the calculations are actually, actually yeah, predicting the right thing. Thank you. Um, Paul, do you have any comments? No, nothing further to add to that. John? Yeah, just one thing. Um, Ian was talking about the different sizes of containers where there was seemed to be more damage. Um, many years ago, I was on a ship and we did an American charter and uh, the container sizes were 35 feet long. So we had to reconfigure the whole ship. And I was asking about this and Emily Malcolm McLean, who was uh, the guy who thought about containers initially, his idea was that every container should be only 35 foot long. So you didn't get a mix of containers. Mm -hmm. It's only since then that uh, people who think they're smarter than he was have started, you know, building containers of different sizes. And the whole idea of containerization was standardization that you could, you've got your one container. And we had a, con we, sorry, in New Zealand, we were shipping some containers by rail from South Island to North Island, and they went through a tunnel, and they were high cubes, and they all got damaged because the tunnels were too small. Anyhow, that's beside the point. But, uh, anyhow, that's my little thought on it. Okay, thank you, John. Um, Joanne Pillai, I see you, <coughs> excuse me, have uh, submitted several uh, comments and questions. Uh, would you like to um, actually make a, a, a statement or actually read out your uh, comments you've put on? Okay, uh, I've been 50, 60 years in the maritime industry. I've been a ship inspector, I've worked for the MCA, I've worked in the Cayman Islands, I'm a consultant, I train in the LNG industry. I would say, in my opinion, the LNG shipping industry is far safer far safer if you take into consideration the number of accidents and fatalities uh, than passenger ships. Now passenger ships, I'm an independent consultant so nobody can, can sack me now. I'm 73 years old so I'm, I'm not afraid to speak up. I did share a fire uh, safety conference at RENA a few years ago and I shocked the audience by stating what I'm stating now, uh, that I didn't say, talk about uh, container ships, but I did speak about Roro ships and, and uh, passenger ships were accidents waiting to happen. But at the end of the two-day conference, many of the delegates came and shook my hand and said, you're speaking the truth, but we are not allowed to say it openly. Now, as naval architects, we should never be ashamed to state the truth. Now, in my experience over the years, flag states and the IMO have reduced safety standards despite all the platitudes that come out to a bare minimum. All the gold standards that the UK had have been wiped out by the MCA. The MCA currently have virtually no expertise. They depend on class and they depend on consultants to advise them on what's what. And uh, shortly after the uh, conference, which I chaired at, at RENA headquarters in London, we had the 
uh, South Korean ferry where 300 children uh, lost their lives. Now, I am someone who spent many, many years at sea. So I'm a practical marine engineer and naval architect. I've been to 106 countries. I've investigated accidents. I don't know all the answers, but I know a lot more than most. And I always know somebody who can advise me better. Now, uh, for example, I, when the star princess, I'm, I'm digressing from container ships, but perhaps I could go back to container ships. Firefighting systems on large container ships are, I would say, totally inadequate. That's why we're continuing to have the accident after accident after accident, fires and explosions. And so, some of the speakers mentioned that undeclared uh, cargoes have been loaded uh, on containers. You would think that if containerized cargo could, could be actually inspected uh, before they even come on board ship, where they are loaded or whatever, but shortcuts have been taken at every, every stage, just, just to meet the just in time and to bypass real safety. Safety of lives at sea is minimal. Okay, I'll but, stop at this God, point. Can I stop you there? Because you've just introduced the, the next subject, which I really wanted to talk about. And thank you very much for your contribution. Um, the, because I think it's really important, but the comment you made about fire um, on container ships is a really big issue. Um, and we have had several comments in about this subject, which is, um, you know, along the lines of the height of containers stowed on container ships has grown considerably in the last decade. Is there a need to perform more research into fire protection, detection and extinction for these vessels, especially following the major fire on the Merce Canal in 2018? And there's been other fires. And when you look at the length of time it takes to actually distinguish those, uh, uh, extinguish those fires, you know, it's a number of days. It's not just um, a small isolated incident. So perhaps, Paul, I could pose that question to you first. What are your thoughts on fires on container ships? Yes, uh, fires on container ships are a really serious issue. The, the, the risks on there are considerable. And as uh, Jayan has uh, highlighted, um, you know, there's perhaps more that could be done. Um, but as a general point about uh, regulation and uh, government actions, um, I think gone are the days when governments act unilaterally and bring in regulations when they see a need. And um, the, the move nowadays is more towards collaboration with other governments at the IMO and to introduce regulations which can be applied uniformly um, internationally. But regulations are always on catch up. They always really have to wait for the accidents there has to be enough evidence to justify to the economists and the lawyers and uh, governments that there, there is a need for some action to be taken. Um, with respect to the specific issue of fire, I remember there was an incident uh, in around UK waters many years ago. The Norwegian Dream and the um, Everdecent uh, was uh, a, a collision which occurred and there was a fire set off and the UK was was involved with the casualties and trying to um, deal with the aftermath of that. And some of the points that were introduced by the company at the time, Evergreen on container ships, was they had a real struggle to fight the fires in the boxes themselves. So they implemented a system where they could have a, a nozzle which would penetrate into the box so they could inject the water directly into the into the box itself. Um, it's no good just training a fire hose on the outside of the boxes and expect something to, uh, to happen with that. Um, so regulations have come in uh, through SOLAS that require 
lances and to have facilities to be able to penetrate the boxes um, to be able to do that. But I still question the practicalities of using this equipment. And when you have two or three boxes high, it may be possible to do that. But when you've got 12 boxes high, you've got a real challenge on your hand. How, how are you going to do that? Now, SOLAS also requires these mobile monitors to be provided so that you can fix a system up and uh, point the jets of water on the relevant containers when they're on fire. Um, but again, the crews are small. They've got to fight fires in extremely difficult circumstances and situations. They may be involving cargoes they don't know what they've got, uh, dangerous goods involved, could be uh, undeclared or declared even, um, but they've got an extremely difficult situation where how can you squeeze yourself between containers and get up 12 stacks to fight a fire, um, or, or for that matter, down in the hold? Um, when you've got an enclosed hold, of course, you can have a CO2 system, but when you have open uh, containers, um, you know, how are you going to extinguish a fire in, a, in an area that you can't contain a CO2 system? So yes, there are big challenges in fighting fires on container ships. And even though there are regulations which deal with some of these aspects, as I've mentioned, I'm not sure the practicalities of actually fighting fires have actually been really addressed yet. Okay, okay. Thank, you. thank you, Paul. John, would you like to make any comments? Uh, just that I agree totally with Paul. I was um, attending the IMO and all this was being discussed. And uh, the after the meetings, talking to the other delegates, uh, the ones who have sea experience or had something to do with ships just wanted to walk out because <laughs> If you've got 10 containers stacked high, there's no way in the world you're going to be able to pierce that container to put a fire out. And that's the way it is. Three high, you can get away with it maybe, but above that, it's going to be impossible. So I suppose the rules are there, um, but and they're better than nothing. But it's going to be a problem, and it's going to be someone who's going to be very clever to figure it out. So we could do better on that subject. Paul, I do you want to come back on that? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I wonder, you know, from a design perspective, you know, perhaps is, is there a time in the future when perhaps we have to have a fixed fire extinguishing system in a container? And rather like um, your reefer containers where you have to connect them up to a system on board the ship, perhaps you have to connect them up to a fire main or a, some kind of sprinkler system when, when the, sh the box comes on the ship. I know the logistics and the delays and the time and all the rest of it might, might be a problem there, but you know, how, how are you going to fight the fires otherwise? That's a, a good point. Um... David, do you have any further comments? Yeah, there are plenty of people here who are far better, kind of more knowledgeable than me when it comes to firefighting. But it, it, what surprises me is, I, I agree totally, if, if you've got a, um, an on-deck container with a fire on a big ship, unless it, it's low down in the stack, there's no way you're going to get to it. And to be frank, who would want to go up high in, in those sort of circumstances? But why hasn't somebody invented a, a, a robot crawler or something like that? A robot device which can go up there and do the job. It, I throw that out. That, that, I see that, that to me seems to be a logical thing to be trying to do. Um, as far as putting um, uh, fire, fire control within the boxes, and that's an excellent idea. Um, maybe not even hooking the boxes up to a, to a ship system, maybe just having having some sort of fire retardant device inside the box. Um, but these things have been suggested in the past and um, nobody seems to be willing to pay for it. So I think there's uh, an insurance issue there. 
Um, although what I have learned over, over the years is that if you want anything to be done, um, it has to be done through either costing, mon costing somebody money if, if, if they don't do it, or through legislation. So the, I think probably the only way this is going to work is, is, is to actually have legislation which requires each container to have its own fire, fire prevention. Um, the technology is there. The technology is there for just a, a few tens of dollars to put a device in the box which will monitor the, monitor the temperature of the container. It will monitor the whatever you want to do in the container. And these devices can talk to each other. So they boop, 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 until they, they find a device which can actually see the satellite or, or whatever they're, they're connecting to. The technology is there, but nobody's prepared to pay for it and, and, and to put it in the boxes. Uh, it, it, interesting. It leads on to a um, another subject um, that was going to come up later, but I'll, I'll mention it now, uh, which is should emergency positioning indicating radio beacons or transponders be fitted to containers to help with location if lost overboard? I mean, it seems to me that we're almost talking about making containers a bit smarter. Simple answer. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> John, any comments? Yes, um, th that would be uh, ideal. And, and as for the an extinguishing agent inside the uh, container, I can't see that being too much of a problem. I've got a little boat and I've got a, an automatic extinguisher in my engine room of my little engine. Um, so I can't see a problem having one in a container. The, which would be helping because where the problems might occur, if you get a fire in the middle of a stack, you know, you've got 17 containers across thwart ships, 12 high, uh, you've got one container stuck in the middle there that, you know, with a, say an undeclared cargo of fireworks or something and bursts into flame, there's nothing even you can't even stick anything in the side of it, you know. So uh, I think a, a self-extinguisher in a container, as David said, is not expensive, and uh, it could be retrofitted as well, probably. Um, I noticed, Dennis Barber, you've made some comments. Uh, perhaps you'd like to uh, uh, share, share them um, vocally. If you'd like to um, take the floor for a moment on the uh, subject of the fire fires in containers. Yeah, OK, thank you. Um, well, I, I was listening to David, David Tozer and he was saying about uh, making the containers uh, more self-contained in terms of their firefighting ability. It did strike me that um, why not? Uh, in tankers, we had you know, gas many years ago which of course takes the oxygen away and therefore you don't have explosions. And it seems to me logical that if you can't fight the fire, then you treat it rather like you do with the, the final shot in the engine room, that is the CO2 systems we, we can smother a fire with. You have to say, well, we have something which will snuff it out. Indeed, as they do on aircraft engines and things like that, places like that, you can't climb out on the wings of airplanes to fight fires. So they just, um, have a system which uh, tries tries at least to snuff it out, and I would have thought that's not the end. that's not that difficult. Surely, if a container is going to carry dangerous cargoes uh, or something flammable, uh, then it should also be provided with the means by which that could be controlled. Okay, thank you very much, Dennis. And uh, Golam Jordan has made the comment, uh, which I've just lost, which was <laughs> um, about uh, firefighting drones. Could they? you have firefighting drones that were controlled from the wheelhouse. Uh, another useful um, idea. So um, Edwin, you've just put a comment on here. Perhaps you would like to um, uh, t tell us all your uh, thoughts on this matter? <laughs> no, it was really just an observation to Dennis's comment that we have, um, we have uh, firefighting in every dangerous cargo container. And this sort of said, well, it really is, it's going to make it worse. Just because th there is every incentive today to misdeclare dangerous cargo because it's then cheaper. Um, and that and that is the commercial state of the market. And if, if then we say, if we come up with a rule that says only 
containers that ship dangerous cargo should be fitted with this will make it worse because those containers will be very scarce and they'll be more expensive. And so there'll be even more incentive to misdeclare cargo. So it's it's not the right way to go, I don't think, Dennis. And we have we have a s incredible infrastructure problem with containers. We don't at the moment we don't have enough containers, or they're all on the wrong side of the of the world, uh, and not enough in in China, which is perhaps part of of the issue why we're having all these issues. Um, and and this and and Peter Jenkins was alluding to the state of these containers. <laughs> yeah, it's it's an infrastructure issue that's slightly out of reach of 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 the IMO in in some respects. Uh, anyway, I, I'm, I'm no expert, just, but that was just an immediate reaction to Dennis. Okay, thank you very much, Edwin. Um, I think we'll move on now to uh, stability in hydrodynamics. Um, I've got a number of questions here. Uh, firstly, are the second generation impact stability criteria really an improvement on current stability standards? And is there anything else that needs to be addressed to improve the stability issues, bearing in mind the specific characteristics of container ships, uh, calculation standards, adherence to standards, etc.? Are the current calculations adequately revised to allow for the increases in ship size, stack height, and therefore radius of stack from center of rolling, and thus acceleration in lateral directions, bearing in mind that the wave sizes remain unchanged while the ship stability may be much stiffer. And then finally, the question of synchronous roll in extreme weather seems critical in generating large angular accelerations and pitching forces sufficient to overload locking and lashing systems, as well as causing structural failure of lower level container support frames. Do the officers stroke crew appreciate the issues and know how to react to minimize such motions? Uh, perhaps Paul, uh, I can put you on the spot to start with. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Yeah, that's a, those are huge subjects in themselves. Um, I think the IMO was talking about the second generation uh, intact stability for, for donkey's years. Um, it's certainly um, potentially a, a, a technical improvement on what we had before in terms of a very simple approach to ship stability. There's many more factors taken account of now in the uh, in the second generation, but to to the extent that perhaps it's become a bit overcomplicated and no one's really understanding the full uh, details of that yet. Um, but nevertheless, there is there is the facility to be able to take into account many of these factors for windage and rolling and all the rest of it. Um, and as we've already said, I mean we we probably can't make the ship um, totally safe. It, there's always going to be a situation where you've got to take account of the weather, um, the direction that the ship is going, the speed the ship is going. There's always going to be some operational aspects and there has to be a certain discretion for the master to be able to make those judgments. Um, but nevertheless, um, those are very good questions and I think um, perhaps it would lead to further debate within the IMO um, or research even before that to demonstrate particular need or a weakness uh, in the current regulations. But as I said, it's taken many, many years to get to where we are now with the second generation stability. So more work to be done, I think. Okay, thank you, Paul. David, do you have any comments? Um, I think Paul's covered the, uh, the stability aspect, the hydrodynamics. Um, I think you can say that the class is uh, upgrading, modifying their, their ship motions formulations um, to, to represent the very large ship. So I think that's, that's all in hand. Okay, thank you. Um, John, do you have any comments? Uh, well, not really. When Paul was talking about uh, how long it took for the second generation intact stability to come around, I remember the representative from IAX at IMO saying, there's only three people in this room who know what they're talking about, and I'm not one of them. <laughs> so, um, 
I I really don't have much comment. It, it's probably a bit above my pay grade. I'm but a simple sailor. <laughs> I don't believe that for one minute, John. Uh, thank you for that. So moving on, um, and this is sort of talking about the, the structure of the ship itself. Um, do we fully understand the structural dynamics of these ultra large container ships with these containers on them? Are the interesting phenomena that we don't understand? And are the structural changes that can be brought about in the design of the vessels to prevent stack failures, even in extreme sea conditions? So David, any comments, thoughts? Yeah, the, the whole structure of the ship, uh, yeah, a lot of work has been done over the, over the last couple of decades um, to, in, to ensure that the container ship hull structure is, is man enough. And when any technology stretches beyond, beyond the known bounds, you have to invest in, in making sure that everything is safe and all the methods uh, deal with it adequately. Um, one thing that's come out of that, we've mentioned before, whipping and springing. The, the flexure, the vibration of the hull uh, wasn't, wasn't taken into account years ago, and not explicitly anyway, and now it is. It's actually calculated for the, for the hulls. Um, the torsional uh, strength of the container ships is a, is a key one as well. The, the warping stresses from the twisting of the ship uh, can be well, well over 100 newton per meter squared, um, well over 150 maybe even more. So uh, the, the torsion of the ship is complex. It hasn't been fully uh, solved operationally in my, in my opinion. We have class rules uh, for the design of the hull structure, which will, which will do all the, all the um, requisite calculations. But when it comes to the actual loading computer, um, for, for, for bending of the hull, you can put the weight distribution on, of, along the hull, or, your cargo, your, your ballast, your bunkers and so on, to calculate the bending moment at each section along the ship and you can check that there's sufficient uh, hull modulus at that point to be able to bear that, that bending moment. Um, and the same for shear, but for torsion it's a lot more complex because you apply a twist at one end of the ship, it produces stresses in the other end of the ship. It's, it, you need to consider the, the total distribution of the torque along the ship to get any meaningful answers out. And that's not done real time within the loading computer at the moment. So that's that's a weakness in terms of the hull structure. Um, it's particularly relevant to the large ships because as soon as you get to a beam of 60 meters or so, you're getting much bigger torque on the hull than you would with the smaller ones. Um, that also raises the question about the strength of the ship uh, when, it, when it's being loaded. Um, Bulk carriers, for example, as you're loading each hold, discharging each hold, you're, you're doing intermediate steps, calculation steps to make sure that you're not overstressing the hull during, during the loading and unloading of the ship. Uh, the same is done for container ships, particularly on the big ones, because you can get, again, you can get those very, very big twists in the hull if you're taking the containers out of different holds, port starboard, whatever. So that, that, that's all sort of coming along. So I think, yeah. Pretty, pretty much the whole structure of the ships is, is being dealt with adequately under, under the um, revised and enhanced procedures that the, the class societies are using. But I still have that, that little question mark over the, the loading computer and the way it deals with the torsional forces that the ships are experiencing. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, John, do you have any comments? As far as a, a quick one just on the the torsional strengths and whatnot. Uh, when you're loading a, a ship, a container ship, you have uh, two, two, you've got an import condition and you've got an at sea condition. The import condition allows you to load the ship in a, and go over the at sea condition uh, stresses, but you've got to make sure that you're back to an at sea condition before you sail. And I can remember the torsional thing was, was depending on the ship you were, some ships were much more prone to easier, where it became easier to twist a ship than some others. Uh, the last one, I, one of the ones I did was uh, 3000 TU, and you could put a 20 ton container on the starboard side of number one hatch and twist it. That was all just a 18 to 20 tons would go over you go over your your limit. So it's something which I say it's beyond my pay grade. So 
but it, it just a matter of interest that one <laughs> thank you very much john i think i think the useful thing is john you bring another dimension and you make us think about practical things and too many naval architects are actually uh focused on on uh, desk experience rather than on actual real experience so it's very valuable um paul do you have any comments uh, yeah the <clears throat> david said a lot about the actual uh, stress analysis and uh, mustn't forget that the torsion is added to the other bending and shear stresses as well so um, it's the complete uh, combined loading together with the whipping and uh, and vibrations in the hull and as was reported by the meib on the msc napoli um, those issues were brought to the fore then um, and of course, you never know uh, in detail about the um, quality of the welding, whether the uh, original ship construction was was built as it should have been, whether the weld quality was was right, um, whether perhaps repairs have been made since then that have uh, had an effect on the structure of the ship. And also with these uh, massive uh, ships that we've got nowadays, the thickness of the steel, uh, particularly in the uh, shear strakes and the uh, uh, hatch combings, are so huge that it's difficult to gain the quality of those materials and high tensile materials, um, particularly in all these different loading situations, different temperatures the ships operate at. So the, there are many issues and whenever you're extrapolating the known um, philosophies, then you, you're always going to end up with some problems that are going to come to light. So I think um, there's always going to be issues that need to be identified quickly and then addressed as much as possible. Okay, thank you, Paul. And I've noticed Andrew Worrell here has come up with a comment. Current loading computers can deal with torsion, but whether the calculation methodology is sufficient to cover the more complex torsion for container vessels would need further investigation. Um, moving on, Peter Jenkins, perhaps you would like to just um, uh, come uh, unmute and just talk a bit about your comment on commercial pressures, because I think it's just a useful uh, strand to uh, put in there. So, Peter, if you would like to speak. Thank you and good morning, everybody. Um, we've heard an awful lot about commercial pressures on just in the just in time container system. And I'm wondering who ultimately pays the financial penalty if a voyage has to be extended to avoid heavy weather, which is not anticipated in the container securing arrangement, but was actually applied before departure. Presumably there is a pressure and presumably somebody pays the bill. And one could say it is the price of safety, but who actually forks out and pays for it if the, if, if the arrival is delayed and the, the schedule is disrupted? Uh, John, do you have a, a comment on that one? Yeah, if um, if the ship is delayed due to bad weather, that's uh, that's an acceptable risk. You you know it's it's uh, it's an acceptable commercial risk. You can't avoid it if if you're going from say A to B, and you you've uh, I want to say weather routed, um, which a lot of them do these days um, and you do run into bad weather uh, if you have done everything in your power as captain to proceed with, the term says with utmost dispatch and take into account the safety of the ship you shouldn't be penalized for that and the I don't know who would actually if you arrive late and you're delayed two days because your berth's been taken by another container ship. I don't know who would pay for that. That would, uh, probably the lawyers would have to come into that one, but uh, it's an acceptable risk you know, to, to avoid bad weather, to avoid damage to the ship, to, 
to proceed with utmost safety. That's where it is, you know. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, Paul, any comments? Uh, no, I've not got any involvement with the commercial side on that, but um, what I would like to highlight is the work that MCA did a number of years ago, which was related to the human element. And um, they, they did some work in partnership with shipping companies and p &I clubs and others um, to produce uh, a guide on human behavior in the shipping industry. And uh, they're, they're well worth a read um, because they highlight some of the reasons why humans take shortcuts. We all do it, we do it every day. And having a good understanding of why we do things, um, you know, uh, and it, it, this may be the person in the office, the, the planner, it could be the designer, the naval architects, it could be the shipbuilders in trying to get the ship completed on time. Um, we're all there taking these small shortcuts. Now, how much of that is adding together cumulatively and um, making an unsafe uh, environment or ship. Um, so I would just recommend that all naval architects as well as people operating ships have a look at those human element um, pieces of work because there was some good research and some good work put into that. Okay, thank you. David, do you have any comments? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, what Paul and John have said. Um, the commercial com commercial pressure is, can be troublesome, and the cure, I think, is to make sure that everybody in the uh, in the ch chain of command understands the risks that they're taking. Then it comes back to the training again. Um, the question about the weather routing, changing ship speed if, if she's feeling a bit delicate. Um, the captain knows what he's doing. The captain's able to make the right decisions. Um, I speak to one captain, I said, what's the best thing we can do to make your ship safer? What, what would you want? And he said, I want floodlights. Floodlights on the bridge so I can see the surface of the water. And to me, that, that, that sums it up. The guys on the ship know what's going on. They know what needs to be done. But is the guy back in the head office going to accept their decision to slow down or, or cost the company some money? So it's, it's getting that, that relationship right and training, education, let everybody in the, in the chain understand the decisions that are being made so they can, they can fully support them. And it's really the safety culture within all the organizations involved in it, that the uh, captains have got to feel empowered to be able to make those decisions. And I think sometimes that's actually quite a hard uh, call when you're uh, at the coal face, phoning up head office to say there's a problem, the weather's not very good. Right, thank you for that. Um, so the last area I want to talk about here is maximum TEU capacity. I've got one question directly on it and one sort of slightly um, off, off tangent, but I'll put these to you first, David. There is no size limit for maximum ship length, width and draft, especially the length. Is 400 meters ship length too much, isn't it? It reasonable such limits should be suggested to IMO and included in the SOLAS convention. That's the first one. Second one is the, the increasingly large TEU ships means there's never increasing reliance on container loading software to demonstrate compliance with the CSM. However, this requires appropriate levels of training stroke competence as the software can be quite complex. Also, as there's no requirement for the software's lashing module to be approved by class, this means the calculations in some software programs may be inaccurate uh, or not fully aligned with the CSM. And in some cases, there's no lashing module provided at all. The latter then means that crew need to resort to manual verification of the lashing forces with reference to the CSM, which may not be practical for a, large, a very large ship during a short stroke busy port call. Your thoughts, David? How long you got? <laughs> uh, well, we've actually not got that long. We've got about eight minutes left. Oh, okay. 
seven and a half then. <laughs> no, um, first question, maximum size. Um, it's a, a massive subject. My prediction was always 24,000 TEU, and um, I am really pleased to say, hey, we got there. I, the ships will get bigger, I can promise you that, um, because that's the nature of the, of the industry. Everybody wants to have the biggest ship, except for Maersk, who like to under-declare their ship size, but they still got the biggest ships anyway. Um, so yeah, there's, 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 there's that competition to always have biggest. Um, but we've reached now pretty much the, the dimensional limits that the Suez Canal can take. I'm not thinking of ships hitting the bank. I'm thinking of what the, <laughs> what the regulations for the Suez Canal say. Um, the maximum beam, beam and draft, build radius and so on, we're just about at that. Um, we can only stack one, maybe two tiers higher without having to shift quite a few bridges around the world. I don't think you, I think there's a couple of tiers clear of the, uh, the bridge over the Suez Canal. So the ships are reaching the, the limit of what the Suez Canal can take. Um, other ports, the, fortunately the ship drafts haven't been increasing. They're still running at about 14, 14 and a half meters, um, even as the ship size goes up. So that's not too much of a limit at the ports. Um, but they've, they've still got the um, tidal windows to take account of. They've still got the berths. Um, the container gantry cranes can now reach out the 60 meters though to get the foot, to get to every container on the ship. If their outreach increases very much more, that's gonna cost the ports severely because they're gonna to have to start doing some, or many ports will have to start doing a lot of major civil engineering to reinforce the key sides to be able to take the longer outreach cranes. So, if you can make the ships any bigger, then you're actually increasing the time in port as well. And that, that changes the economics. So, to me, everything is stacking up at the moment to say that we, we, we're just about as big as we want to go. Life, life will get too complicated if we make the ships much bigger. The only exception to that could be, um, and this has been talked about for decades, is a mega hub type system where we revolutionize container shipping um, to have maybe five mega hubs around the world, uh, which would put all the facilities and the ships that serve them and almost per purpose built to shift vast numbers of containers around the world and the rest of the fleet just becomes feedering from those from those mega hubs will that ever happen i don't know it's it's a nice thing for a, a, a student project to consider yet again um but we'll have to wait and see what i have learned is to say never say never okay thank you david i've noticed edwin says he'd like to weigh in on the size issue please so edwin would you like to speak Thanks, Sarah. Um, Briefly. Yes, just to say that the environmental imperative is also actually going to drive size increases just because, particularly in the container ship industry, the route to better um, CO2 uh, carbon intensity is larger ships. And that's not just larger ships at the end, but the average size of container ships have been increasing over time. So what used to be a feeder would be, what, 1,700 TU, went to 2,300, it's going up to 3,000, 4,000 TU. And there's all this size creep all along the entire uh, sort of fleet. So, you 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 know, what we, we had early Panamax, then post-Panamax, post-post-Panamax. Now, we, you know, we, people are routinely building 9,000, 11,000 TU vessels and, and so on. But there is this imperative from the environmental side that is pushing size increases on ships. The other thing I also note is that there is actually no way of defining adequately what is the maximum TU a ship can carry. So it's a bit of a random number. Yes, we have bridge visibility rules and certain things, but within that, there's a lot of variation as to as David alluded to, what 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 is actually the TU nominal TU capacity of a, of a container ship? So nobody really knows. What I would say, Edwin, is um, in the holds we're up to ten eleven tiers, and if you go any higher than that, you have to start either splitting yeah. stacks or, yes. or or using the upgraded boxes that we talked about. Yeah. If you need an ISO standard, and the same applies on deck as well. Um, Okay, thank you, David. Uh, very quickly, John, have you got any comments on this? No, not really. Um, I think uh, I dread to think of anything bigger than we have at the moment. That's all I can say. <laughs> okay, thank you. Paul, have you got any comments on that? 
Um, no, I, I, only that I don't think it will happen that there will be legislation to govern the maximum sizes. I think it will always be driven by commercial um, and the, the, the needs of the industry. And um, it will only be uh, our tolerance for what we will accept in terms of uh, costs and um, also the cost in terms of um, the environment uh, damage that might be done and all the other aspects that will limit the size of ships, in my opinion. Um, just while I'm on, Sarah, I would like to make one last point, uh, if I may, that we haven't really touched on yet, completely separate. OK, uh, well, that's fine. Yes, fire away. OK, uh, you, you briefly mentioned um, earlier on in the presentation a question about um, losing containers over the side and, and having uh, transponders or something on the containers to be able to find them. Um, I do think that this th there is a potential gap at the moment in terms of losing large numbers of containers, that no one seems to be particularly interested in finding those containers. Um, many of those could contain dangerous goods. Um, they could be quite hazardous, both to uh, human health, but also uh, the marine environment. Um, and the, the, there seems to be no incentive other than, right, I've lost a load of containers. Um, I'm going to have to make a claim on the insurance. And my insurance premium might go up because I'm losing containers from my ships. But once they've gone over the side, uh, I t basically, the implication is that I can turn a blind eye to that. I'll get a payout from my insurance company and no one's interested in finding or dealing with the consequences of all the potential damage to the environment. And I think there should be more obligations on people to, to be able to find and retrieve those containers that they've lost. OK, thank you very much for that, Paul. I think you're absolutely right. At this point, I'm afraid I'm going to um, put together some concluding comments because um, uh, we've run out of time. So I would like to say thank you to the panel to, for being a fantastic panel and trying to field some uh, left of field questions without any uh, sight of what they were. And I'd like to thank everybody for their uh, submissions, both during and before the workshop. I realise we haven't addressed absolutely everything and some of the detailed questions we haven't, but we will be putting together all this document all the information that has come out of this and actually reviewing it to inform the output of uh, this workshop, which will be talked about in a minute. But any further thoughts, comments, please submit them uh, to Rena HQ. There was an email address up at the beginning and we'll probably put that on at the end so people can see that. Um, and I'll now hand over to David Aldwinkle for the closing comments. Well, thank you, Sarah. I'd just like to say, that you, Sarah, and Paul were very uh, helpful in encouraging us to have this workshop. I believe it's been a success and all good things must come to an end. So I thank you for that. We've already thanked the panel. But I, I would like to say that, uh, that it is the intention to produce a summary of this in the Naval Architect Journal uh, and also the two committees, the Arena Safety Committee and the IMO Committee, will endeavour to produce an inf paper, which hopefully will go to the um, subcommittee on carriage of cargoes and containers for their CCC7 meeting in September 2021. So I hope Edwin doesn't mind more work, because I know how very busy you have been. And again, finally, thank you all for your participation today. It has been most valuable. Thank you all.